bite and fight and another good goalie performance as the Minnesota Wild take down Vancouver. We dive into the win, plus yet another lackluster effort for the Wild power play. And do we have a potential spot for other teams to try to exploit now that the Wild have added some enforcement? We look at that and more today on Locked on Wilds. You're locked on Wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen every day. And just as a reminder, Locked on Wild is free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. On today's episode of Locked on Wild, we recap a 3-2 to two overtime win for the Minnesota Wild with some good play by the Wild defense and Cam Talbot with another strong start as he tries to get his season back on track. We also dive into a couple of things that continue to be issues. The wild power play, still a little too pass happy. And an interesting wrinkle that opponents may try to exploit down the stretch of the season now that the wild have added some size and physicality to their lineup. All that and more today on Locked on Wilds. My name is Seth Topal, host of Locked on Wilds, your veteran Minnesota sports content producer and captain of Locked on Wild and happy to be along with you for one of many episodes here for this Friday, our first episode of the day. And so we've got uh, a couple of other episodes that you can tune into on your way home from work today uh, or wherever you're headed for the weekend. Uh, the Minnesota Wild ended up picking up a win over the Vancouver Canucks by a score of 3-2 to two in overtime. Jewel Erickson, the game winner after Kirill Kaprizov and Kevin Fiala got the scoring started. And uh, it's a formula that we saw kind of in the, the early portion of the season after the Wild had a ton of those come-from-behind victory wins. The Wild did get a couple of uh, wire-to-wire-ish wins um, and some overtime wins as well. So uh, nice to see the Wild continue what has been a, a good rebound for them. And uh, we saw the full showcase with Jacob Middleton getting into the lineup for his first action as a member of the Minnesota Wild. Uh, we also saw some uh, continued good things from Nick Delorier. And we uh, got another strong performance from Cam Talbot uh, as he continues to reinvigorate his season uh, for the Wild. Now, the first thing that I want to touch on, this felt like a playoff game against Vancouver, and obviously um, some bad blood between these two teams. Uh, just ask anybody out there on the ice. There were no shortage of uh, skirmishes and, uh, and fights that uh, broke out between these two teams. So an incredibly physical game, and it felt really good to see the Minnesota Wild be able to contend with that uh, against Vancouver. Um, a more physical team that was trying to really kind of impose their will on the Wild. The Wild did not seem phased. They uh, they seemed like they were able to play at that style and to uh, hold their own against Vancouver throughout the course of the night. So the Delorier and Middleton additions seem to certainly be paying off for this team. Now, uh, the other thing that I think has helped key in on um, a little bit of a turnaround record wise is the uh, fact that the Wilds' defense has uh, started to rebound again after getting a little bit um, of help in Jacob Middleton. And so uh, that has helped the goaltending, but the goaltending has been much better as well. We'll dive into Cam Talbot's numbers uh, a little later on here in the show. But um, just a, a fun game between these two teams. The pace was very good early on. Uh, both defenses settled in a little bit. And uh, even though Vancouver got the game tying goal in the third period, 
uh, with about 12 minutes to play. I didn't really ever feel super in doubt about the outcome. It just, especially at home, the way that this team is playing, you felt like they were going to get an opportunity. They had plenty of them. Uh, in fact, you know, as uh, a couple of people mentioned, I know Michael Russo mentioned it on Twitter for sure, uh, just a lot of swings and misses by wild players on pucks, whether it be passes up the ice or shot attempts from um, anywhere in the offensive zone. Just seemed like there was a lot of um, a, a lack of crispness to uh, to things out on the ice. But uh, as Russo also mentioned, the uh, the fight and the uh, the heart of this wild team, um, one of the sole reasons that they were able to stick in that game, um, especially when uh, when they were trailing one nothing, because they just kind of willed themselves. To, uh, to getting some wins um, in the game to get the overall win for the night. So uh, very encouraged by the fact that the Wilds seemed to uh, be able to handle what Vancouver was trying to do, uh, although there was one situation in which um, I, I may have found a little something that opposing teams may try to uh, exploit down the stretch. Uh, I hope not, but um, you know the NHL. Uh, if an opponent can find a weakness, they're going to uh, they're going to continue to push the the envelope until you do something about it. So we'll chat about that here today as well. But all in all, a good win for the Wild. They now have a back to back coming up on Saturday and Sunday. We will see Marc Andre Fleury on Saturday against the Columbus Blue Jackets, and I would imagine then right back to Cam Talbot on Sunday against the Avs. So uh, should be a great weekend. It should be a fun weekend uh, for this wild team. And hey, winning is fun regardless of how it happens, what the circumstances are. It's, uh, as Kevin Malone in the office said, it's just nice to win one. So glad uh, glad to see it. Some good things from a couple of members of the squad. I do want to talk about, when we come back, the power play. And this uh, interesting wrinkle that I have teased that other teams may try to attack in this wild lineup. So uh, we'll do that. We'll discuss the, um, the other good things later on in the show today. But uh, continuing to recap the Wilds 3-2 to two overtime win over the Vancouver Canucks. We'll do more after this here on Locked on Wild. Spring is here, and it's time for you to spring into your weight loss journey by eating better, and Built Bar is here to help. But if you've run through all the usual flavors of Built Bar and you're looking for something just a little bit different, puffs are the way to go. If you haven't tried them, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. As with most Built Bars and Puffs are no exception, they contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Your average candy bar contains around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. So if you want to get in on the Built Bar madness, or want to try the new Built Bar Puffs, head to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Again, use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Continuing today's episode of Lockdown Wild, again, thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen every day. Once you're finished with your first listen today, keep an eye out for our bonus episode, the Locked On NHL Buyers Roundtable, taking a look at some of the other teams throughout the East and the West that were most active at the trade deadline and added the most impact to their rosters as we gear up for the Stanley Cup playoff push. Locked On NHL is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Did anybody else notice in the, uh, especially early on in the game against Vancouver? 
Marcus Foligno dropped the gloves almost immediately off of the uh, the opening faceoff, and uh, so he went toe to toe with Luke Shen. They uh, they fought. Foligno pushed him to the ice. Both players got five minute majors uh, for fighting right off the bat. So at that point, grief line unbuckled. Foligno in the box. Greenway and Erickson Eck left to fend for themselves. Kirill Kaprizov took that spot for a little bit. But let's continue down this road. After that, later in the first period, Jordan Greenway and Oliver ekman Larson get tangled up. Both players get two minutes for roughing. And so uh, no power play for either team, so that doesn't necessarily hurt you, but we did get four on four at that point in the game. Um, and then in the third period, Jordan Greenway gets another penalty this time though, for delay of game. So not necessarily as related, but still an opportunity in which Greenway was off the ice. And so the grief line was not in full capacity at those points. I wonder if we are going to see teams try to do this more as the season unfolds is to try to kind of goat the grief line, the Felino, Erickson, Eck, and Greenway line, try to guilt them into penalties to keep them off the ice. Um, you know, it, this is in response to Nick Delorier's comments when he was first acquired by the Minnesota Wild in that, you know, he wants to be the one out on the ice, enforcing the general rule and order of the land, and uh, being the one to go to the box if he gets into a scrum with a member of the other team. He wants to be the one to uh, to do that so that Marcus Foligno can spend more time on the ice and uh, worry more uh, about his scoring outputs as opposed to having to uh, lay the justice down as well. But if you're an opponent of this team, you can't feed into that. You can't say, well, gee, if they've got this grief line, we can't fight them at all because uh, there's going to be retaliation from Nick Delorier, from uh, Jacob Middleton, and from others on this team, from Felino, from Dumba, from uh, Duhame. There are plenty of guys that can get a little retribution if needed. If I were an opponent, though, and obviously you don't want to you know, intentionally take penalties, but I would do exactly what Vancouver did in trying to get members of the grief line into the penalty box so that that, uh, that grief line is not fully composed to be able to uh, to cause some uh, some chaos on the ice, so th that's going to be something that we'll watch here um, over the next couple of weeks, just to see if that ends up being true, or uh, if that was just Bruce Boudreau kind of taking advantage of what he knows about this organization. It um, it remains to be seen, but was just kind of in in getting notes ready for this game, was just kind of thinking about that, and I'm like, huh. That did happen. Uh, I wonder if that's something that uh, opponents, especially with some of the teams that have um, similar types of instigator players, could be something that we see down the stretch, which is going to mean that uh, you know Marcus Foligno and Jordan Greenway have to be more cognizant of uh, where opponents are at at all times so that they don't end up stumbling into a potential penalty to uh, to pull that dynamic defensive line off the ice. So uh, that was an interesting wrinkle that uh, thought about yesterday, um, thought about uh, if that's something that we might see down the stretch for uh, for opponents to try to kind of throw this wild team off off whack, um, out of whack. Now, the other thing, that just continues to not be super great is the power play. And uh, the power play went over again uh, in this game. It just, 
it seems like they are at a spot that we were hoping that the Wild wouldn't get to. And to be fair, the Wild have um, started to get back on track a little bit. But there was a stat on Twitter that the Minnesota Wild are amongst the league's worst in terms of uh, shot percentage uh, during the course of a power play. It has become almost detrimental to this team to take penalties because they just, they press, they're trying to do too much. And uh, so then you have players who are just being careless with the puck. Kevin Fiala had on one of the power plays was trying to thread the needle kind of behind his back to a teammate that ended up not being able to anticipate the pass. Shocker. And uh, ended up heading back to Sesame Street. So it all comes down to a couple of things, I think, with this power play. Number one, first and foremost, let's shoot the puck. Too much time for this wild team just skating around the perimeter and if you can't tell, obviously, I'm super thrilled at uh, being able to talk about um, a- another O for night for this wild power play. Um, too passive, too much passing, too much skating to the left or right side of the net, getting real close. And instead of trying a shot that has at least a percentage chance to trickle in, the. Um, they elect to just continue to pass. And, you know, this is not revolutionary news by any stretch, but it's real hard to win at the NHL level when you don't outscore your opponent. It's almost impossible. If you don't outscore your opponent, you're not going to win a game. And five on five numbers being what they are, I I just... In, in seeing it tweeted out by Brett Marshall, by Michael Russo, by others, where is Jewel Erickson Eck on this power play? So if you are going to do line combos and defenseman combos, um, what would be the harm in going down to one defenseman, bringing Jewel Erickson up, Eck up on the first power play unit and having him be one of those guys that just cashes in opportunities right around the net. What would be wrong with that? What also would be wrong with instead of, you know, pass, 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 try for a bad angle shot and end up missing or having it deflected entirely. What if you go to the other end of the spectrum where you are a team that is aggressively trying to run it up and down the court every time they have the puck and uh, just trying to play with a little bit more intent and a little more purpose because we've seen it play off on the penalty kill. And I know the, uh, the Canucks scored a power play goal, but I thought the penalty kill has been way better. Now, in the uh, in the game last night, obviously the Wild had some trouble clearing the puck uh, on penalty kill situations, but at the end of the day, I think that penalty kill unit is trending in the right direction. But uh, for this Wild power play, it continues to just spiral out of control, and uh, I I I don't know because you've got too many good players. And Jewel Erickson at Kirill Kaprizov, Kevin Fiala, Matt Boldy, Matt Zuccarello, and uh, countless others. You've got too many good players to have a power play that is almost inept at uh, at scoring. So those those were kind of the bad things about what we saw in the uh, in the game. Nonetheless, the Wild did uh, overcome all of it to uh, to come away with the win. So it, it's it's something that bears watching down the stretch and uh, to see if these continue to be issues or if the wilds can get things kind of ironed up just like they have with goalie and the defense. So that 
is uh, is a little homework for you, the listeners, is to uh, check out some of the um, just just check out some of the things that um, visually look different for this team. Uh, we will finish by taking a look at Cam Talbot's continued resurgence for this Minnesota Wild team as uh, he had another great start against Vancouver. So we'll break that down a little bit as well coming up after this here on Locked on Wild. The NCAA tournament is in full swing. My bracket, however, is toast. And if yours is toast just like mine, don't worry because there is still plenty of betting you can do on college basketball's premier sporting event. And you can find info on that with all the latest odds, contests, and player props at betonline.net. They are the number one source for all of your sports betting needs and info. Bet Online remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. So head over to their website or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. You can find it all at Bet Online, where the game starts. Final segment of today's episode of Lockdown Wild. And again, thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen every day. Cam Talbot with another strong effort against the Vancouver Canucks. He has been very good since the Wilds acquired Mark Andre Fleury. And a little bit before that as well, obviously, he had the, uh, the shutout um, to kind of lay his claim to the goalie starts here the rest of the season. And um, just looking at some of these numbers, Brett Marshall of the Sound the Foghorn podcast doing a little heavy lifting for uh, Talbot's numbers um, in his worst stretch of the season and his numbers in his best stretch. So Talbot from February 16th to March 3rd went 1-4-0. He allowed 21 goals. Um, had a uh, expected goals allowed of 12. So his expected goals were 12. He actually gave up 21. So his goals saved above expected was negative 9. His goals against average 4.33. Save percentage of 863, uh, 86.3%. And a high danger save percentage of 64.1%. Uh, saves on 25 of 39 high danger chances during that stretch. Now we move to March 24th, and he currently is at 6 0 0, has given up 12 goals. His expected goals allowed 10.72. So he has uh, given up 2.7 more goals than expected. His goals against average is 1.97, 926 save percentage and an 86.2 high danger save percentage, um, 25 high danger saves in 29 opportunities. If you take away the Detroit game in which Talbot gave up five goals, the numbers get even better. He's 5-0-0, seven goals allowed. He has um, an eight, uh, he has it was expected that 8.42 goals would be scored on him. So his goal saved above expected is 1.42. Want it to be in positive territory. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, goals against average of 1.40. Save percentage of 946 and an eight, uh, 87% high danger save percentage. So those numbers, Brett breaks it down a little further than that. Just massive turnaround these last few weeks from Cam Talbot. What has changed? Some may argue the defense turned around. While that's partially the case, uh, the defense has gone from 2.4 expected goals allowed per game uh, between February 16th and March 3rd to now 1.79 expected goals allowed uh, between March 8th and March 24th. The big change is he's returned 
to form uh, to make those big saves. During the rough patch, he was stopping just 64.1% of high danger shots since March 8th. The number has shot up 22% to 86.2%. He has allowed 14 high danger goals or did allow 14 high danger goals during the five game rough patch and has allowed just four during this recent winning streak. So is it Cam or is it the defense? Well, it could be both. Minnesota Wild defense has improved dramatically, lowering their expected goals against per game from 2.4 per game to a stellar 1.79 per game. But when there have been lapses, Cam's be, uh, been there to make the save, and that combination is creating success. What's contributed to the success for Cam on those high-danger shots is aggressiveness, says Brett. When he was struggling, he was deep in the crease and getting beat because he wasn't taking away angles. During this hot stretch, he's been coming out to the top of the crease, cutting down angles and blocking more of the net. Challenging shooters to beat him, and that's resulted in more saves and fewer rebounds, which is a sign of confidence, ladies and gentlemen. It appears as though Cam Talbot is back. And as we said when Marc-Andre Fleury was acquired by the Minnesota Wild, this could lead to a byproduct of Fleury being here and that that was the push that was needed to get Cam Talbot back on track. And it certainly seems like he is back to where he uh, should be and back to where we hoped he would be um, for the entirety of the season. His numbers now starting to get uh, way closer to what would be considered respectable numbers for a goalie. 26, 12, and 1 on the season, 2.84 goals against average and a 9-10 save percentage. A couple of shutouts sprinkled in as well. Uh, all in all, the problems that we saw with this wild team, it seems as though the good defense is uh, really starting to get the goaltending back on track. So we'll see how Mark andre Fleury does in his first action as a member of the Minnesota Wild uh, coming up on Saturday. And so hopefully he can benefit as well from the defense kind of getting things figured out in front of him. And that is going to wrap it up for today's episode of Locked on Wild. So now that your first listen of the day is done, make sure you keep an eye out for our bonus episode today, the Locked on NHL Buyers Roundtable. You can find uh, the Locked on NHL podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, just like Locked on Wild. We're available anywhere you listen and anytime you want to listen to your favorite Minnesota Wild podcast. Keeping you as up to date as possible on all things Minnesota Wild, because if a puck drops, if news breaks or a trade happens anywhere in the state of Minnesota, Lockdown Wild has you covered with new episodes every Monday through Friday as part of the Locked On Podcast Network.